So today I want to give you a quick introduction how you deal with stripped and statically linked binaries because this is a little bit annoying to explore. But let's do this by first comparing a regularly compiled binary to a stripped binary and then the stripped binary to also additionally statically linked. The example binaries that we will be using were compiled from the source code of the format 4 level from Protostar. This is an exploitation challenge, but I mainly wanted to use it because it was just right there. It, it has a main, then it calls volm, and in volm there are then three functions that belong to libc. There's fgets, printf, and exit. So it's, it's just a nice test. If you want to know how to exploit this challenge, try it yourself or you can check out my binary exploitation playlist specifically episode hex 13 this is where i'm solving the format 4 challenge just fyi back when i made this challenge it was called exploitexercise.com now it's exploit.education anyway so here are the three example binaries so the first binary is just plain gcc compiling that source code and format for stripped is just a binary compiled with minus s, which is the flag to strip the binary of its symbols. And obviously format for stripped and static has the minus s flag to enable stripping, and then also minus static to statically link all the libraries. So format for not stripped, dynamically linked, and not stripped. Format for is dynamically linked, but stripped. And format for stripped static is statically linked and stripped. And of course you should notice the size of the binary. So the dynamically linked binaries can use the functions contained in libc. So they are dynamically linked from this location. So they are much smaller, but the statically linked binary has to include all the code from libc inside of this binary. And that's why it's so much larger. For this example, I'm using the free reversing tool and disassembler and decompiler Ghidra. So let's have a quick look at the not stripped binary. And then let's go here into the functions and we see it recognizes all these different uh, libc functions like print, like printf and puts. And it also recognized main. And we see here also because it's not stripped, it knows the name of the main function, which is main. And it knows the name of the other function, vuln. And in vuln, it also recognizes fgets, printf and exit. Now let's compare this to the stripped binary. Analyze that as well. Okay, so the first thing that is noticeable is that there are still all these functions recognized. Exit, fgets, puts, printf, they are all still there. But you also get these unrecognized functions now. You also notice you can't find main. But I made another video about how to find the main in a strip binary. So let's quickly do this. We go to the entry function and we know that uh, this is here the address of main. So let's go there. And again, this is the main function. You could also rename this with pressing L. We know this is the vuln function, but because it's stripped of all the symbols, the binary doesn't contain the information that this function used to be named vuln. So that's why it's an unrecognized name just made of the address of where that function is. But when you look into that function, you will see that it still recognizes fgets printf and exit. The reason for that is because it's dynamically linked and it has to resolve the symbols in the library that it's loading. fgets printf and exit are implemented in libc. So when this program wants to call library function, it has to resolve these functions. That's why there can be made the connection of what's the actual name of these functions. So even though it's stripped, you don't know the internal name in this program for this function, you still get like the API functions, the libc functions, and you can still like kind of guess what it's doing. So it gets a string and does printf and exit. Okay, just call it get print exit. Anyway, now let's move to the statically linked binary. Let's analyze that as well. Okay, so this takes a bit longer. You see it's still uh, running and doing stuff here. In the bottom right, you can see that it's still doing stuff. It's a statically linked binary, which is pretty large. It contains all the libc functions. So of course, this will take a moment. All right, it's finally done. So let's check out the functions. And now all the functions are unknown. It only knows the entry point. But we know how to recognize main. So we can go to the entry point and we know that this first function should be libc start main. And then the first parameter should be the address of the main function. This looks exactly the same like the strip binary. There is no symbol main and there's no symbol vuln. So those names are not given, but let's go into here. 
And now here is get a little bit scary because here these functions are unknown. And when you are now reverse engineering this and exploring this for the first time, you might wonder, oh, what's maybe in this function? And you go in here and then it starts to look like completely insane. What the heck is going on here? Also, I noticed here a little bit of a bug or kind of an issue that is quite interesting and you should be aware of that stuff like this can happen with reverse engineering. You should maybe not fully trust a decompilation or analysis like this. Because notice how here are four functions. But when we compare this to the other binary, we only have three functions. So where's that fourth function coming from? When we click on the functions, it will jump in the assembly to where this function is. And you see here, this third function ends here. And then there's this, like a new function starts here. So this other call is actually in this function here. And if you pay close attention, you will notice that this is the same address as the volume function. So the volume function is calling itself. And if you, again, paid a bit more attention, you will notice that this is actually the start of main. This, this was the main function. Now, functions typically end when there's a return. And this volume function doesn't have a return here. Um, it, it's missing. There's just a call. And then immediately afterwards, the main function starts. So why is there no return? Let's quickly look again at the strip binary. When you go here to the same spot, you will find that there is an exit. An exit always means that the program ends here. And so I guess Ghidra knows what exit means. So it added here a flag in the flow analysis to overwrite the standard flow, I guess, and determine that this is the return of this call. It's a call terminator. That's why when they show the decompilation here, the function stops here instead of running into the next code afterwards. And because this is a statically linked binary, the information is missing that this is an exit. So it thinks th that this function could maybe return and at some point uh, continue executing into main, which obviously makes no sense. So this is a bit tricky here and definitely looks a bit weird. But how do you deal with this now? So, so I, I'm not a professional reverse engineer, so I don't know exactly what the best method is. But I see kind of like two ways how, how I would deal with that. First, I see a dynamic approach. A lot of the libc functions are wrappers around syscalls. A printf will most likely end up in a write syscall. A file open is just a, a syscall open. The exit function will result in a syscall exit. So you could, for example, use gdb and set a breakpoint here in this function and then always execute a single call here. And then you trace and record which syscalls are being called during this execution. And from that alone, you can kind of get an idea what this function does. It will be extremely easy to recognize, for example, the exit here. Printf and fgets might be a little bit more difficult, but you can also look here at the number of parameters. Now, decompilers like this might make mistakes with the number of arguments here used, but it's a very good indication. And you notice, for example, that it takes here a size and that here's a buffer. You can see it's used by both these functions. So the parameters are also another puzzle piece that can help you to identify what this function might be doing. Now, this method one is more like a general reverse engineering tip because this doesn't only apply to statically linked libraries like this, but it generally applies to any reverse engineering of any function. Looking at it in this way are the puzzle pieces that you can use to come up with uh, a name for the function, an idea of what this function might be doing. Now, method number two for dealing with something like this is using function signatures. I guess the most widespread or known function signature is called flirt, IDA flirt signatures. To assist IDA users, we attempted to create an algorithm to recognize the standard library functions. So IDA has this feature to handle these flirt signatures, but uh, it's such a widespread thing that you can find plugins for Ghidra as well. So on GitHub, I found this repository from NW Monster called apply sig. And here is Python code that can apply IDA flirt signatures. So you can, you can simply download this Python script. And then in Ghidra, you go to the script manager. In the script manager, you check the script directories. And you can add either a new directory where this Python script is, or you can copy it into any of the locations listed here. OK, so let's copy this into the Ghidra scripts folder. And then let's refresh that list. And here it just showed up. You can also search for it down here. So let's execute apply sig. Now it's asking for a signature file. So where do you get these signature files from? There are a lot of people creating signatures. And I found here this GitHub repository by push EVP, uh, a signature database. So let's try to find something fitting. I guess we have Ubuntu, libc6. 
Um, again, here's a little bit of guessing. There are a lot of different signatures for all the different versions that are available. So I'm actually, I actually don't know which Ubuntu version I have here exactly, maybe something like that. Um, it doesn't really matter. A lot of them are also similar, a lot of them different, so it, it always varies. So I guess maybe let's try one of the bit newer ones here. Let's download this one. I don't know. So let's download that signature, and then we can select it. Apply SIG. Now it takes a moment. Uh, it's doing a lot of stuff. And look at that. It recognized this as printf. Now it didn't recognize the f gets and it didn't recognize the exit. Most likely the reason for this is that the libc I used for statically linking here is not the same for what is included in those signatures. And so with a little bit of experience and educated guesses or just trying out all of them, you might be able to find one that uh, matches more. But even though it didn't directly recognize here to be exit, when we go into this function, we do see that it then inside of here calls exit. So it has this uh, function trampoline, the subroutine here, whatever. So we know that this is simply exit. And so this other function here, let's go in there. Now this looks still kind of, ah, meh, it looks a bit crazy. But it does recognize some of the internal functions here. So here's a call to ll unlock wake private, and here's an io get line info. So by looking at this, you could now actually go into the libc source code and look for functions that basically you see here is having, having like ifs and then it calls this function and then calls this function somewhere. And then you might be able to fairly easily identify uh, what this function does. Anyway, you, you, you get the point. You can use flirt signatures or any other kind of, there are different concepts of how you can recognize functions in, in binary. It's not a trivial uh, process. There are different strategies how this can be done. And flirt signatures are one way how to do this. And uh, flirt signatures have the advantage that it's very widespread and you typically find a lot of scripts and tools that already use it and handle it for you. All right, I hope this was helpful to you and gives you an idea how to get started with statically linked binaries. But obviously, signatures don't only apply to statically linked libraries. Any program could include functions for various other things where maybe signatures exist. A very typical applications for signatures could also be cryptographic functions, because maybe uh, a program has an MD5 routine included. And so maybe you can find uh, signatures for cryptographic functions, and applying that, you would then recognize that stuff is just uh, MD5. Also, signatures could also give false positives, so don't be careful. Don't just like collect all the signature files you can find and then just apply them. Uh, you might get rubbish results. But if you are kind of careful with applying them and um, also use your brain, okay, verify, does this even make sense what the signature found here? Um, overall, it can be an extremely helpful tool that really cuts down the time that you need for reverse engineering.